Hello, everyone. Welcome to Touch Tank Tuesday. My name is Olivia, and I'm the educator here at the Deep Bay Marine Field Station. We are an education and research facility that is part of Vancouver Island University. Uh, and a lot of our research focuses on shellfish, uh, shellfish aquaculture, and researching our local marine environment. Uh, and today I have a very special critter for you from our touch tanks that we have not covered before. Uh, although it's a little similar to limpets, what we've looked at previously, today we'll be talking about chitons. Uh, chiton spelt C-H-I-T-O-N not exactly how it sounds, but chitons are amazing marine mollusks. And we will talk about the species that I brought for you today. Um, before we get started, I wanted to talk a little bit about the heat wave that we are having right now in BC. As you can tell, it's a little bit hot in here. Um, so even though it's quite hot, our touch tank critters are very, very lucky because they are actually able to uh, stay cool in these warm temperatures. We have water that's being pulled directly from Deep Bay here. And so that comes through into our facility. And usually the water temperature is at about 10 or 11 degrees. Right now it's at 13 degrees. So even though that seems like a very small amount, for us, two degrees, who cares? Uh, it's actually really important when we think about our marine animals and especially marine invertebrates. Some species have this very wide range of temperatures that they can live at and successfully survive and reproduce at. But some species have very narrow temperature ranges that actually causes them to uh, only be able to survive and do very well in this small range. Uh, so it really depends on the species. As well with the temperature change, what's happening is uh, as temperatures increase, some species are being uh, signaled or uh, told basically, uh, to begin to reproduce in the summer. So it's very exciting to have these temperature changes. Some species don't do so well with fluctuations in temperature. So uh, it really is a big change, but our invertebrate critters here at our touch tanks are uh, very happy and comfortable at the moment. Uh, so today we will be talking about chitons uh, and especially the critter we have today, which is the giant Pacific chiton also known as the gumboot chitin. I'll give you a little picture of it here. So this is what we're talking about. This is a chitin. And uh, for perspective, this is my hand. It is quite big and you can see from the side, quite gooey on the underside. Um, but this giant Pacific chitin is very cool and very unique to the Pacific. Um, so it's actually unique to the Northern Pacific, not just though in the Pacific Northwest, which is quite interesting. Um, but yeah, so we will first talk about chitons in general. We'll talk about uh, the group and a bit about the species or the general group. And then we'll talk just about the gumboot chiton uh, and some interesting facts about it. So. If you have any questions at all, please put them in the comments section and I will be happy to answer them live. If I don't get back to you right away, uh, I will come back after and reply to you in the comment section. Uh, sometimes I might not know the answer or sometimes I just might not see it because I'm too involved in what's happening at the moment. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Uh, chitons are amazing marine mollusks, so they're invertebrates, and they're in that big group or phylum mollusca. So they are marine mollusks, and if you remember uh, species such as oysters, scallops, uh, snails, and limpets, those are all in that huge phylum mollusca. And when we talk about chiton, we're, chitons, we're actually talking about this smaller group that's the class, so it is quite high, the class uh, polyplacophora, it's a hard word, polyplacophora. And polyplacophora, or if there's a species in it, we would call them polyplacophores, 
an even harder name. Uh, this group or class is what we call chitons. So any species that's in that, we are talking about chitons when we're talking about those species. And there are 941 species, as well as some species that have gone extinct in that class. So it's quite diverse. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we have about 31 species of chitin. Uh, so there are quite a few. Um, the one today is very special and really easy to recognize because of the color of the outside of its shell, so the top of it. And actually I say shell because it looks like one shell, but it actually has eight shells. And these eight shells come together and sort of interlink like armor. So even though it looks like one shell, there's actually eight of them lined up to cover its body, which is quite amazing. Uh, chitin, uh, chitons tend to live on very hard surfaces. Uh, just like when we're talking about snails or limpets, they love those hard surfaces to crawl over. And chitons are actually pretty fast moving. Uh, this chitin has moved across the dish since I've been sitting here. Uh, uh, even though they look like they are uh, set in one place or sessile, they're actually, they actually move around quite a bit. They're nocturnal, so they feed at night and stay in one place usually during the day, unless a predator or someone scary, such as myself, comes and puts them into a new container. And now this chitin is actually moving around quite a bit. Um, so they tend to be on these hard surfaces. They can be subtidal or intertidal, and you can find them all across the world. Uh, so within those species, it does depend on the species where it's found, but you can find chitons all the way around the world in warmer and cooler temperatures. So they're quite amazing and able to live in these different environments. Uh, when they're in the intertidal zone, many species can actually live high up on that intertidal zone, which means that they spend a lot of time out of water. Uh, for these chitons, um, just kind of like limpets, they're able to keep moisture into their bodies and shells by holding on to the rock surface. So that was the same with limpets, and that allows their gills to stay wet for longer periods of time, and it allows them to breathe out of the water then because they have water and moisture there already. Uh, so that's one of the unique things about them. What's also extremely unique about chitons is that there aren't any freshwater or brackish water chitons. So there are only chitons that live in marine environments. So they only live in salt water. And that's what kind of makes Deep Bay here not the ideal environment for the chitin. So here in Deep Bay, as you might have remembered from other sessions, we have a, sort of a mix of salt water and fresh water. Um, so it's kind of a little bit brackish. Um, and, so, and so this wouldn't be the perfect location for them. I'm not sure where we got this chitin particularly, uh, but if we did get it, it was probably from a deeper area, so subtidally, where the salinity didn't change as much, or it's from the west coast where you have uh, water exchange coming straight from the ocean. So it probably is not from right here in our beach area. Um, and so the shell that goes along the chitin, I'll give you kind of a look right now. We'll take a look at our, our um, giant Pacific chitin. And we'll take a look at it here. And you can see the chitin from the top. You have the shell here. And there are actually eight shells. So uh, you can't quite see them from what we're looking at. Maybe if I get a better angle, you can see some of those indents. And I will wash off. You can tell that it's quite warm here because of the condensation that's happening on the outside of this. OK, so this is a better view. And we'll let it focus. But you can see these ridges, these ridges that go along the top, that is its shell. And so there should be eight different ridges all the way along its body. These ridges are made out of um, calcium carbonate, but not the calcium carbonate that you would make oysters or scallops from. They're actually uh, made out of aragonite, which we've talked about before, being that type of calcium carbonate or form of calcium carbonate that uh, is a little bit more dissolvable. So it's a little less able to tolerate highly acidic areas. So I'll just take some of that off. So 
this chitin has this beautiful protective shell. And what it does is it protects it from predators, it protects it from lots of waves, but it also acts as a way to allow it to flex and move. So you can see right here, it's flexing its body up onto the side of the glass. And uh, so what basically it would not be able to do that if it didn't have this shield-like armor that kind of um, articulates. So it's able to flex up and down. Holding those shells together goes all the way around, I'll show you here, all the way around here is the girdle. The girdle is basically this ribbon of muscle that goes around the body of the chitin. And that muscle helps hold all of the shells together, so those eight shells underneath. Um, and it also helps it to move. So that's the purpose of the girdle. So what's really unique about this chitin is that chitins don't usually look like this. They don't usually have, I'll bring you back down here, they don't usually have the girdle expanding all the way over. So that's what this sort of tissue is, these muscles. This is all part of the girdle. And so that muscle usually only goes around the edge, but for the gumboot or uh, giant Pacific chitin, those are both the same common names for it, uh, this chitin um, has it actually growing all the way across its shells, which is, which is why it's so easy to identify. It's very easy to identify. Usually you would just see shell pieces that are going over that look quite like armor. Um, so that is the girdle that goes around. And so on the inside, there's this very, very soft body that's much like the limpet or the snail. So we'll take a look on this side. You can see the body underneath. What you're looking at right now is the underside of the girdle coming around the edge and its mouth. So you can see it has its mouth here. Its mouth is really, really similar to the um, limpet where it has a radula. So remember, it's that conveyor belt of tiny teeth that run, um, they uh, basically are scraping substrate. So right now it would be scraping the glass that it's in, looking for algae because it loves to eat algae off of rocks. And in our tanks, it'll eat algae off of the walls. Um, and so its mouth is right there. It has a sensory organ that comes out right under its mouth and that sensory organ helps it to taste. And so it's uh, tasting while looking for food. It doesn't have eyes. Oh, look at it moving. You can see that it's actually moving backwards right now. So they don't have eyes uh, and they also don't have what we would traditionally call a head. Their nervous system is kind of dispersed all across their body. Um, so they don't have a traditional um, nervous, nervous center, which um, something like an oyster does where it would have its ganglia in one specific place. Uh, this one, it's actually all across its body. And this is quite soft feeling, this chitin. So let's talk, I'm going to pick up the chitin if I can. I know it doesn't really want me to, but we will talk a little bit here about the underside of the chitin. One of its defense mechanisms is that it actually rolls up. You can see it's starting to roll into a tiny ball. So let's talk before it does. You see these slits right here? That's where its gill is. So it has gills on either side of the slits, which allow it to breathe. And so I actually see it uh, turning into a ball. So let's see how much of a ball it will turn into here. So it's trying to protect itself. So it's turning into this ball, crunching forward. Um, and so it's protecting itself from predators. It's making sure that it has enough water in its body. And you can really see where those shells are right here. So this is a really, really cool animal. Yeah. And there we go. I'm not pressing on it at all. It's used its muscles to pull itself in. I remember the muscles are on its girdle, which is this part here that goes around. And that's really what's forcing it to create this tiny little ball which is absolutely amazing. So here's the tiny ball of chitin right here. Um, and so this is to help it so it's not eaten by anything. It's to help it survive if something happens. Um, so let's say it gets uh, left out in the intertidal zone. It has no rock to cling to. It clings to itself, which is fantastic. Um, and let's say maybe a seagull is trying to eat it because seagulls tend to eat these. Well, um, it would put itself into a ball and hopefully be harder to carry. 
So I'm going to put it back in the water and let's see what it does. Let's see if it will un... Yeah, it might pull itself out of this little ball. Let's watch and see. Okay, so it's staying in the ball, which makes sense because I'm still here, but we'll talk a little bit more about it. So it has a foot, which was that centerpiece that you saw running down its body. And the foot helps it to move just like a, um, just like a snail would need to move um, by contracting and releasing its muscles. So that's that pedal foot. So this one is still in the ball here. I've let it go because maybe it will release itself. Um, Let's see if it focuses. Yeah. Uh, so this is how it rolls up. Uh, this, let's talk about this species in particular. So as chitin goes, this is a very, very unique species, which, um, and it's mostly unique because it is giant. So the giant Pacific chitin can get to be 35 centimeters long. So that's really long for a chitin, and it's the biggest species that actually exists. Um, it doesn't look that big to us here. And this, uh, this one individual is actually not as big as they get. But this chitin, um, it, will, it will probably grow. If it uh, enjoys living in our tanks, it'll probably grow up to 35 centimeters. So it has a bit of growing to do. Um, and this species is from, it, it lives in Japan, Alaska, and California, all the way down to California. So it makes its way really across the Pacific, which is fantastic. A lot of the species we've talked about over the last few months have been just from Alaska down to California, but this one's also found in Japan. Uh, it's also um, found up in Alaska and even more north. And you can see that it still thinks that we're a threat which makes sense because we're still here. And that's why it's still in a ball, it's just protecting itself. Um, so the gumboot or giant Pacific chitin, so those are its two names. And it, the reason it's called a gumboot chitin is because people who are exploring tide pools, um, they thought that it kind of looked like a gumboot, or if you're in other regions, also called a rubber boot or a Wellington or Wellingtons. Um, so that's what they thought it kind of looked like, which makes sense. It does kind of look like rubber. Um, and so that's why they named it that, but its official common name is the giant Pacific chitin. And so this is it here, continued to be rolled up. So I wonder what we can try to do when I'm ending this session is I can take a look into the touch tank and we can put it back in the touch tank to see how it reacts, if it will flatten back out and crawl away. Um, okay, so we'll try that in just a minute. First, we will focus, hopefully focus back on me. There we go, we're focused back on me uh, to talk a bit. Um, so we will try that in a minute if anyone has any questions. I currently don't see any comments which is okay, maybe I covered most of it. Uh, this chitin can live up to 40 years. So they can get to be 40 years old and that's just what we know of. Um, it is not recommended for aquaculture or consumption. Yeah, very good. Yes, they are edible. Um, I have read that they are not great tasting, um, but I have not tried that myself. So I read that actually uh, many First Nations uh, communities and cultures uh, traditionally had eaten uh, chitin, probably because they were readily available in the intertidal area, which is great. Um, and there are actually many places around the world that cook them and eat them as a delicacy. I had read that when they do eat them, um, that they are a little bit smelly and rubbery tasting, like the texture is very rubbery. Uh, and the amount of muscle that you actually take off of a chitin is quite small. So it's very thin. Um, so regularly you'd have like a large foot or muscular foot that you would eat. Um, but for these ones, their foot is apparently very thin, but I haven't tried it before. Um, 
Yeah. I don't know, Michael, if you've you've tried eating a chitin before. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure what the DFO policies are for harvesting. Uh, you can probably check that on your website. Rather, if these are even on a list of harvesting, uh, you can check that on the website as well. Um, and I've not tried it, nor heard of anyone who has. <laughs> yeah. Um, very good. So if anyone has any questions, you can ask them now. Otherwise, I will attempt to put this chitin into our touch tank and let's see if it ends up unrolling. Um, okay, this will be a bit of a move here. So, so we have our chitin and let's go to the touch tank. So our chitin is in the shallow section of our touch tank and you can kind of see it going in here. I'm going to set it actually on the rock where I found it away from this anemone. And let's see, I will take the camera and point it down and let's see if it unravels itself. So there it is right there beside the anemone and the giant sea cucumber. The anemone is disappointed we did not give it to it. Uh, oh, in terms of predators for this specific um, chitin, the predators are uh, humans, seagulls, some, some sea stars, as well as there's a small snail, like a predatory snail that will eat them. So it is still curled up and not moving, which is okay. It still thinks that we're a threat, probably if we go away. <laughs> well, it was a good experiment to have. Um, so the, uh, the small snail I was talking about, the predatory snail that eats chitons, actually just eats its girdle. So what it does is it's a small snail and it will go on top of the shelled area where we have that thin layer of girdle on this um, gumboot chiton and it will start to eat it. So it'll take its uh, radula and it will actually drill and eat the girdle, so that muscle off the top of the chiton. So it's not looking to eat the petal, it's just eating along the top. Ooh, thank you, Julie. So Julie asks, how do they reproduce? I forgot about that. <laughs> um, so each chitin species is a little bit different in how it reproduces. Uh, for this species, um, they, will, they have males and they have females. And they will broadcast spawn, at least the males will broadcast spawn sperm into the water column. Um, when there is a female, what happens is the female, those two slits we saw underneath, the female will have its eggs kind of in pouches there. And usually what happens is the sperm will come in and fertilize those eggs inside and she'll kind of hold on to those for a little bit to try and protect them and help them to survive. When she's ready, then she'll release them either one at a time or all in one bout. Um, and then they will hatch and some of them have a larval form that actually has eyes, so these rudimentary eyeballs. Um, and some chitons uh, will actually come out of the egg as just tiny replicas of the adults. And the difference is because some of them will stay in the eggs and they'll actually develop in the egg. And the reason that happens is because they actually have nutrients in that egg and they kind of stay inside the chitin. And so they will actually give a live birth, those species, uh, where basically the egg will hatch inside them and it'll look like these tiny chitons are coming out. Other species, it will be that those eggs will come out, they'll hatch into a larval stage, and at that point they will develop into, um, they'll go through a process of development to become those small chitons. So it is, there are these two main ways that it can happen, but there's a lot of diversity. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think like other mollusks, it's kind of impossible to tell from just the outside. Um, Julia has asked what the sex of the one we just saw was. Um, so you would actually have to like go inside and check them out, which they would not survive, uh, to see which reproductive organs it has. I'm not sure if they have like sexual dimorphism which is like that they might be bigger or smaller or look a little bit different if they're females or males. I'm actually not quite sure. That's a really good question. Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, okay, and let's just double check. I'm gonna take a look to see if it has rolled back out to continue on its life.
nope, we've still scared it, which is okay. Um, I will post a picture hopefully later that has uh, our relaxed crawling along the seafloor chitin in it that's enjoying itself. Well, thank you all for joining me today. If you have any more questions, please feel free to post them into the comment section and I will do my best to answer them after the fact. Um, and hopefully we'll have another cool critter next week. Uh, we did just get a new crab species in the touch tank, which is really cool looking. Um, and it wasn't looking very well when we found it. So I'm hoping that it, with some nurturing and love, that it will, uh, it'll be healthier for next week to be part of our touch tank Tuesday. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Julie, for joining. Thank you, Michael, for joining as well. And I will talk to you next week. Uh, have a very happy Canada Day. Take care, everyone. Bye.